Welcome to our second lecture covering chapter three of our textbook. As you know, the name of this chapter is Formation of a Contract, Offer and Acceptance. Uh, if you haven't watched the first lecture, please do so before you dive into this lecture. But before we get started, let's just do a bit of a review of where we are in the course and what we are, what, how, well, how what we are covering today fits into the big picture. This is a slide I've shown several times already, and I'm going to show it many, many more times. Here's a hint. If there is one slide you need to know, like the back of your hand for this class, it is this slide. This is the key organizational document for the course. This, you need to know a lot more than this, obviously, but these are the topics, and you need to be able to talk about this topic and know its connection to this topic and know its connection to this topic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Let me go through just a brief summary of this document one more time. You'll hear it again and again and again and again, but it's really, really that important. So please just, if you've mastered it, tune me out for a few seconds, but if it's still something you're working on, spend a little bit of time with me as we cover this material. So we're talking about the elements of a contract. Again, another way of looking at elements are the recipe. What are the ingredients we have to have to have in order to have a contract? And there's only four. There's only four things we have to have in order to have a contract. The first is we need an agreement. The second is we need consideration. Both parties have to provide it. We'll cover this, by the way, in a future chapter. Then we also need legal capacity. Again, this will be covered in a future capacity, uh, excuse me, future chapter. And then we have legality, which is our fourth and final element, and it is covered in also a future chapter. We have this fifth element here, but it's really not an element because in most contracts, it's not required that it be in writing. It's a good idea, but it's not a legal requirement. So we have four elements of contracts, but you know what? Some of these elements have sub-elements, like in the case of agreement, we actually have, depending upon how you look at it, two or three things that we need in order to have an agreement. Specifically, we need an offer and we need an acceptance. And this, in this chapter, chapter three, we're going to cover offer and acceptance. In fact, we've already covered offer in lecture one, and today we're going to cover acceptance as well as some additional information about offers. Uh, this a mu topic of mutual assent we'll cover in chapter five, which will be the next chapter that we cover. If we're missing an offer, we don't have an agreement because an offer is an element of an agreement. If we don't have an offer, we don't have an agreement. If we don't have an agreement, we can't have a contract. If we don't have an acceptance, we don't have an agreement, therefore we don't have a contract. So we need to have all of these pieces. A very common mistake that students will make is that they will think that an offer or an acceptance is an element of a contract. Well, kinda. But please don't fall into that trap because while it's not completely wrong, it almost always causes students to lose points because what they do is there'll be a test question that says, give me the four elements of, agree of contract. And what I'm looking for, of course, is agreement, consideration, legal capacity, and legal object. Instead, what the student does is says offer, acceptance, and maybe they say consideration and capacity. Well, I'm going to give them a point for consideration. I'm going to give a point for capacity, but they haven't given me legality or agreement. It's, I'm not going to count off if you give me these things, but they're not elements of contracts. They're elements of agreement, right? So if you, there was a test question that says, give me the elements of agreement, that's when you say offer and acceptance. Now, if you get confused and you can't remember whether offer is an element of contract or whether it's an element of agreement, no worries, just list them all. So let's say I said in a test question, you list the four elements of contract, and you list offer, and you list acceptance, and you list agreement, and you list consideration and capacity and legality. I'm going to give you all the points because you listed one, two, three, four. This is what I'm looking for. You can list other things that aren't clearly, clearly wrong, and I'm not going to count off for them, but they're not really, strictly speaking, correct because these are elements of this, not of this. Hopefully that makes sense. If this is causing you some heartache and you're not quite sure, come see me. We'll spend some time working through it so you can kind of get a better sense of this. But the important thing is there's only four elements to contract, and I have the four elements here. 
write it on a flashcard, and when you're in line at the grocery store, pull it out and review this. Um, it's not hard, but it does require a bit of time to get to this finish line on this one. Uh, there will be students in this class who don't master this, and uh, it's disappointing because if you've listened to one or even two of my lectures, you will have you heard this several times, at least in the early lecture. So I spend a bit of time on this to pay off because I promise you there will be several, several questions on the final and the midterm that address just this issue. Okay, let's go forward. Okay, so we are again talking about this topic, acceptance on this uh, in this particular uh, chat this particular lecture of chapter three. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip over all of the offer material that we covered in the lecture, the first lecture on this chapter. Here we go, so we finished all the offer material. Now we're ready to move on to acceptance. Okay, so we're gonna start with the uh, definitional term. And we can see it's in red and it's highlighted. This is a term from the textbook. Again, uh, so much of this course is definition, so please note that this is one of those vocabulary terms that you need to know, both for quizzes, for the midterm, for the final examination. And again, a helpful, helpful tool for this is Quizlet. Um, these are already programmed into Quizlet. If you go to Canvas, you'll see um, uh, a, a tab that you can click on to get into Quizlet word list, but you can build your own if you don't like the way that uh, the ones um, that I've made available to you are drafted. Okay, so you'll want to be sure that you're familiar with this, but let's break the definition down. Of course, acceptance is a noun, and we see here that we have assent, also a noun. These are basically synonyms. What does assent mean? It means agreement or acceptance. It means saying yes to something. If I assented to the surgery, it means I told the doctor, go ahead and perform the surgery. So in this situation, acceptance and assent are synonyms, but it's not good enough that we have an assent. We need something more than just an assent to have an acceptance. We have additional requirements in this definition that have to be satisfied. Specifically, we have two adjectives that come before assent. We know that not any old assent will work as a contractual acceptance. The assent has to be unconditional and unequivocal. Um, those are two things that we need to have. We also have a third thing we need to have, and the assent has to be from the offeree. Uh, going back to the story that we followed the other, or we were following the last time. Let me go back to little Bobby and Sally. Here we go. Let's imagine that Groover is over here. I'm, as you can see, a very talented artist, and I'm going to draw myself in this picture. Okay, so Bob, Bobby is offering to sell his frog to Sally for $10. He only wants to sell that frog to Sally, and he does not want to sell it to anyone else. But I'm here, and I overhear this conversation, and I want to accept this offer. So I say, Bobby, here's $10 for that frog. Well, has, does that count in acceptance? Well, let's go back and look at the definition to see if my acceptance was effective. The unequivocal unconditional and unequivocal assent by the offeree. Was I the offeree? No, not according to Bobby, because the offeree is the person to whom Bobby made the offer. That was Sally, the little brunette girl, not me. I'm the adult in this situation. Bobby didn't make the offer to me, so there's no way I can accept his offer. Sally can. Sally can accept, assuming her acceptance or assent is unconditional and unequivocal, she's the only one who can because that's the only person that Bobby has made the offer to. So this is our definition for acceptance. We need to have three conditions satisfied for us to have a valid acceptance. Um, you may notice that we have had three conditions here, but we also had three conditions with offer. And you know what? They track with each other. This is our super cool thing. We'll see this as we're going forward. So our first requirement is that the offeree cannot accept something that does not meet the requirements of the offer. In other words, the offeree's off, um, acceptance has to be exactly the same as the offeror's offer. So imagine that, that um, we go back to Bobby and Sally, and Bobby and Sally say, he says, I will sell you this frog for $10. And Sally says, I accept your offer. I will pay you $9.99 for the frog. 
Did she accept Bobby's offer? It sounded like she did. She said, I accept. But then she put a, a little caveat there. She's not willing to pay the whole 10 bucks. She's only willing to pay $9.99. Now you and I might say, well, gosh, that's a penny difference. Who cares about a penny? I mean, that's a rather trivial amount. You know what? The law doesn't care whether it's a trivial amount or a big amount. Any difference is going to count not as an acceptance because it does not exactly match what Bobby uh, put forward. So that's what we need for this first element. The offeree doesn't have the power to accept something that isn't exactly what was contained in the offer. Moreover, and this is actually just a little bit more specificity about this requirement, so this is kind of, this isn't a separate requirement, but this is just a more specific way of looking at this requirement. Moreover, the acceptance must be in the form that the offer specified. So let's say that Bobby said to Sally, um, uh, Sally, um, I will sell this frog to you for $10. The way that you can, the only way that you can accept this offer is to jump up and down three times and squawk like a chicken. Sally says to Bobby, well, yeah, I want to buy your frog. That's a good price. I want to buy that frog for $10, but I'm not jumping up and down and squawking like a chicken. That's stupid. I'm not going to do that. You want my 10 bucks uh, or not? And Bobby says, the only way you can accept my offer is to jump up and down and squawk like a chicken. So he goes, I accept your offer. Has Sally accepted? Why no? Because she has not accepted the exact terms of the offer because the terms of the offer specified the form of the acceptance that must be made. It's silly. I mean, in the real world, people don't include ridiculous um, acceptance procedures like that, but people have the right to. Theoretically, that could happen, and theoretically, Sally would have to jump up and down three times and squawk like a chicken in order to accept Bobby's uh, proposal, if that's what Bobby included in his offer. We call this phrase, and I talked about it in last lecture a little bit, but let me just reiterate. We consider Bobby the master of his offer. He gets to be as strange <laughs> and as, as odd as he wants to in, in terms of his offer. He can say, you've got to squawk like a chicken. You got to, um, you know, uh, say Peter Piper picked a peck of pickle peppers or whatever the thing is. Um, he can be as strange as he wants to. Sally doesn't have a, a way of saying, well, I don't really agree with what you want me to do, but I still want to make the deal. Well, no, you don't want to make the deal because the deal includes how you accept the offer. And if you want to pick and choose, well, I like that part of the deal, but not that part of the deal, you're not accepting the deal. The deal is a take it or leave it thing. And in that situation, Sally would be saying, I decide not to take it. So this is our first requirement that we're going to talk about in a lot of detail. This one's the meaty one, by the way. The, the second two, we're just going to spend a bit of time on this one and this one, but this one we're going to talk about for a fairly long period of time. So let's get started. Okay, this is the mirror image rule. This is the idea that the acceptance has to exactly mirror the offer down to the finest detail. When I look at a mirror myself, it, assuming it's a true mirror, it's going to be the mirror image. I mean, my, my features are going to be reversed, but I'm not going to look fatter or skinnier. My hair is not going to be a different color. My eyes aren't going to be a different color. My clothes aren't going to be a different color. It's going to represent me with all of my warts and my negatives and my positives. It's exactly what I look like. And that's what we want the acceptance to be. If Sally throws in new conditions, new limitations, she changes even the teeny tiniest part of the deal, she's not accepting the deal. She's coming up with her own deal. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not an acceptance. We'll talk about what it is later on. It's a perfectly valid thing to have happen, but it's not what we call an acceptance. So we say that an acceptance must, must exactly match the terms of the offer, must be the mirror image of the offer. Any deviation, no matter how small, how silly, how unimportant it seems to be, acts as a rejection of the offer. So let's say that um, Bobby says, hey, uh, you want to buy my frog for $10? And Sally says, 
why, yes, I want to buy your frog, but I want to buy it for $9.99. Most of us would say, sounds like they got a deal there. I mean, it's just one penny less. Uh, Bobby would be a fool not to take that. Um, but from a legal standpoint, a miss is as good as a mile. Because it's not exactly what Bobby provided, it's the legal equivalent than if, if uh, uh, Sally had said, yes, I'll buy your frog for one cent. We'd all hear that and go, well, gosh, that's not a reasonable offer. I mean, not when Bobby wants $10. Um, there's no way Bobby's going to take one cent if he was expecting $10. Um, but the law doesn't say, well, that's pretty darn close, so we're just going to round up. No, there's no rounding up in the law. Um, it either it's exactly the same or it's not. And anything that isn't exactly the same qualifies as a rejection. Let me give you another example. This was really silly. Let's say Bobby says, um, do you want to buy my frog for, um, or I'm willing to sell my frog to you for $10. And Sally goes, I accept your offer and I will pay you $10.01 for your frog. You might say, well, gosh, that's awesome. Bobby's going to get a penny more than he had expected to get. That's even better for him. He's going to be delighted. Well, no, because that's a rejection of the offer. Um, it is not the exact mirror image of the terms of the offer. So um, when we're making an acceptance, we don't want to be creative. The last thing we want to be is creative. We want to get exactly the same meaning that the original offer has. Any deviation counts as a rejection. It also counts as a counteroffer. So this is the magical thing that we were talking about when Sally said, well, I'm willing to pay $9.99. She is actually rejecting the offer and making her own offer. So now she has become the offeror and Bobby is the offeree. And now Bobby will have to decide, am I willing to sell his frog for $9.99? Maybe I am. Maybe I'm not. The ball is in his court to decide. If he comes back and says, mm, I want the 10, 10 bucks, then he is rejecting Sally's counter and he's making his own counter offer. And this can go on forever, obviously. Uh, so what is a counter offer? It's an, the offer that happens in response to another offer. It's a new offer. And all the rules that we have about offer that we covered in the first lecture apply to a counteroffer. So a counteroffer is really two things. It's a rejection and a counter. It's two things at once. So imagine that um, Bobby had said, I will sell this frog to you for $10. And Sally came back and said, mm, no, I don't think so. I think I'm willing to buy the frog for $9. And Bobby says, no, I'm not willing to. Now Sally goes, okay, you know, I really do want the frog. I will, I will pay you 10 bucks. And she gets out her purse. Well, Bobby can say perfectly legally, wait a second, I'm not agreeing to $10. So I said, but just two seconds ago, you offered to sell me the frog for $10, and now I'm accepting that. Uh, no, actually, you aren't accepting that, because when you made your counter, Bobby's offer went poof. It no longer exists legally. It is true, Sally, that you can make a counter at this point. You can now be the offer or and say, I am willing to buy that frog for $10. But you're just making an offer. You are not making an acceptance. And now the ball is in Bobby's court. I mean, most of the time, Bobby's going to be thrilled. Oh, yeah, 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 five seconds ago, that was my offer to you. So why wouldn't I accept it when you make the offer to me? But maybe Sally's counter has hurt Bobby's feelings, or maybe somebody else has come up in the interim who's willing to pay Bobby $11. Whatever the reason, Bobby can say, no, I'm not accepting it. Because, again, um, it's just an offer, and an offer has to be accepted before you have an agreement in a contract. Now, all this talk about the mirror image rule has to do with the common law. This is important to keep in mind because the common law requires that the acceptance be exactly identical to the offer. And that reflects um, kind of a more simple time, almost like um, maybe a, a little house on the prairie time or something along those lines. When transactions were face-to-face, when uh, human beings were talking to other human beings, when people didn't engage in dozens of transactions in a particular day, uh, when each transaction kind of was a weighty moment. <clears throat> 
um, in the, the two contractors day. Um, and so it was, it was easy to see how you'd want to have a mirror image. But nowadays, when Amazon processes thousands of, of uh, transactions an hour, um, when Walmart uh, does thousands of transactions an hour um, uh, when uh, people are constantly buying things and selling things to expect that each one of those transactions will be that careful and that precise that the offer and acceptance exactly mesh is not as realistic and as a result of this kind of modern technological complex world phenomenon the UCC the uniform commercial code the a statute that controls where the common law doesn't control with respect to contracts, the UCC has substantially relaxed the mirror image rule. It says, you know what, if it's pretty much the same thing, if the acceptance is pretty much the same, we're going to roll with it. We're not going to require things to be exactly identical. Um, we only require that the material terms be the same. So going back to Sally and Bobby's uh, situation, let's say that Bobby said, I will sell this frog to you for $10 and I will deliver it to you in five minutes. And um, Sally said, that sounds great. I will buy the frog from you for $10 and I will accept delivery of the frog in six minutes. That's not identical. So the common law would say, no, Sally hasn't accepted the offer. She's rejected the offer and she's made a counter. But the UCC would say, five minutes, six minutes. I mean, really, who cares? Um, the, the, the amount of time we're spending fussing over a minute, uh, you know, we could have had a deal. Um, if Bobby and Sally think that they have a deal, then who are we to send back and tell them they don't have a deal? Um, really what's going to control is whether the parties think that this this arrangement, whatever they've stumbled into, is what ought to be in effect. So uh, the UCC relaxes that mirror image rule considerably. Now we're still in the common law section of the course, so what I'm really going to be focusing on is the common law. But just know that the common law rule, the mirror image rule, applies to the common law, but not so much to the UCC. There's another term to know about, and that's the click wrap agreement. We'll talk more about that in uh, Chapter 16, which we don't actually cover in this course. Uh, it's kind of an extra credit chapter. Uh, we've all been in that situation. We've been on the computer, and maybe we are uh, going to download uh, an updated version of some software. Maybe it's iTunes, or maybe it's um, you know some other uh, Adobe. Um, or something along those lines and um, we've decided we want to download the, the latest edition or the first edition of it or whatever it is and uh, we've clicked on a few buttons maybe it's free maybe we've paid money but whatever the situation is we'll eventually get to a screen that says that we have to click on this to say that we agree and it's usually a several page document that we have to look over most of us don't look over it and let's say after we look at it we think to ourselves well you know what I mean, I'm okay with like 95% of this, but a paragraph 47, I just don't like the wording on it. I, I really want to tweak the wording. Um, so you are looking now on the screen, well, how do I uh, mark up the agreement? Where can I redline it and say, well, let's change this phrase to this? Or where can I click that says, I agree with reservations? Well, guess what? There is no such thing. It's either a yes or a no. And if it's a no, you're not getting the software. It's not going to happen. It's a take it or leave it deal. And so there's no negotiation. There's no change that you can make. There's no suggested edits that can happen. It's either up or down, yes or no. And these are called click wrap agreements. It's called obviously a click because the way that you indicate your acceptance is you click on the agree or yes or whatever the, the term is. And then the wrap means, hey, you know what? It's one, one item. It's a whole packaged up together. You either say yes to the whole thing or you say no to the whole thing. And um, there is no possibility of negotiation or counter offers. This is a very common thing we see on the internet. Uh, these are perfectly um, uh, legal 
type arrangements. Uh, we'll talk more about how the UCC controls in this area, but the important thing to, to keep in mind is if you don't click on it, you're not going to get the goodies. And the, uh, the offer, or in this case, the business that is uh, providing the software gets to say, yes, these are the specific terms that you must um, agree to in order for you to accept our offer. Okay, so let's talk about how you accept an offer. And there's kind of three paths for this. And I'm somewhat being a little bit uh, simplistic when I say this. There's actually more than three, but for the, for the vast, vast majority of contracts are accepted in one of these three ways, And even though there are a few other ways that it can happen. The main ways are going to be that it is accepted in writing, or it's accepted orally, or, or finally it could be accepted in an implied way. Now, of course, we have to look at the terms of the offer to know how it can be accepted. Remember when Bobby told Sally you have to jump up and down, down three times and squawk like a chicken? Well, that is the way that she would accept. She's not supposed to write anything down. I guess she's making sounds because she's squawking, but that's only part of it. And there's nothing implied about her actions. And nobody runs around jumping up and down three times and squawking like a chicken unless, you know, there has some meaning associated with it or maybe they've, uh, they've got some issues <laughs> in their lives. So we have to look to the terms of the offer. Now, a lot of times the terms of the offer don't specify how you accept it. In the actual uh, scenario that we have with Sally and Bobby, Bobby doesn't even say in here how he expects Sally to accept. It's unspecified. Now, since Bobby is speaking to Sally and they're in the same room or same place with each other, it makes sense that he is expecting Sally to verbally give an answer. Yes, I agree. I will pay you $10 for that frog. Um, that would be, I think, kind of what the social expectations would be, but Sally could also take out a piece of paper and write it up, or maybe she could take out her phone and text Bobby right there. All of those would be um, also equally effective ways of doing it. But again, Bobby could have specified, I will sell this frog to you for $10. The way you can accept it is by, you know, saying, I accept, and then Sally will have to decide whether she accepts or not. So we have to consider, do the terms of the offer specify how acceptance will happen? If they do, then those have to be followed. If they don't, let's talk about some common paths that we see acceptance happening. And of course, our first is going to be in writing. And we're going to talk about the mailbox rule. This is a quirky rule. It kind of reminds us of times in the distant past where we didn't have faxes and text messages and uh, telephones even, that there were uh, uh, delay uh, between the time that somebody sends a message and the time that it is received. So let's go back to those days of yore and imagine how a transaction might happen. Okay, so we have a timeline here. January 1st, Sam makes an offer to Sarah and specifies she should mail her acceptance. Okay, so Sarah knows that the only way she can accept Sam's offer if she chooses to accept is to put her acceptance in the post. On January 5th, Sarah decides to accept Sam's offer she puts her letter of acceptance in a mailbox. And at that moment, she can't get it out anymore. It's a t we'll, see, we'll assume it's the type of mailbox that, you know, it's at the post office. Once you put it in, you can't retrieve it, even if you wanted to. So it's out no longer in Sarah's control. But as we all know, it doesn't magically appear in Sam's mailbox at that moment. And in fact, three days later, it finally arrives at Sam's mailbox. He receives it. So what day did Sarah actually accept Sam's offer? We know that it couldn't have happened before January 5th because that was the moment that Sarah actually accepted in terms of her effort. So it could be January 5th, but the day that Sarah sent it, but it could also be January 8th, the day that Sam received it. Um, and there's arguments for both. Um, let's assume, though, for, for the sake of argument, that on January uh, sixth, Sam actually sold whatever it was that he was offering to Sarah to, um, you know, Sebastian. And so um, 
he um, gets the letter on January 8th, he no longer has whatever it is he was supposed to sell to Sarah because Sebastian now has it. So has he breached the contract? Well, he has if um, Sarah accepted on the 5th because at that moment then Sarah and Sam had a contract and Sam breached the contract by selling it to Sebastian on the 6th. But if Sarah didn't accept until the 8th, Sam wasn't in a contract with Sarah at the time that he made the sale to Sebastian, so he's not in breach. So you can see how it's really important in this transaction exactly the moment that acceptance had happened, the moment that the contract had been created. Um, and and the, the importance comes to the fact that there's this delay and things happen in the delay. Maybe Sam sells it to somebody else. Maybe there's a tornado that comes through and destroys the subject matter of the, um, uh, the, the uh, transaction. Or maybe Sarah had second thoughts and she calls Sam up on January 7th and says, hey, Sam, don't go to your mailbox because there's something in there that I want you to see. Um, I, I, I withdraw my acceptance. There can be all kinds of things, either on Sarah's part or Sam's part, that, that, that uh, can happen between the date that Sarah drops off the mail and Sam actually gets it. So this is the problem. Now, obviously, we don't have this problem when you have a oral acceptance over the telephone or face-to-face. -face. You usually don't have this problem with emails or fax or texts because they're pretty instantaneous. But with the mail, you can see how there could be some significant delays. Um, and so in, in a different era, this was a pretty big problem. How are you going to solve it? Which way are you going to go? I mean, reasonable minds can differ, but the law has come up with a single solution. So let's talk about that solution. And we call that solution the mailbox rule. Again, this is an important rule to know about. It's more historical, I guess, now than, than practical because it's pretty rare that this comes up. But it's still important for a legal professional to know about this rule so that when he or she is advising a client who is in the role of the offer or he or she can assist that offer or in making a better offer for to advance that offer or's interest. So what is the mailbox rule? It's a rule in contract law that acceptance of an offer is effective upon dispatch, that is upon mailing, by the offeree and not upon receipt by the offeror. So that tells us this is the date of acceptance. Acceptance happened on this date even though Sam had no idea that Sarah had put that in the mailbox. So he is in a contract on January 5th and 6th and 7th even though he doesn't know it, right? That's kind of crazy, right? That's what the mailbox rule provides. So um, why do we have that rule? Why is that the standard? Well, there's a couple of reasons why that's the standard. The first reason is that we need to have one or the other. I mean, it's pretty clear that we need to know because things can happen on the 6th through the 7th. And so what we need to know, was there a contract or wasn't there a contract to see who breached and what the damages might be. Um, so we either have to favor Sarah by saying, yes, the contract was entered into on January 6th, or we have to favor Sam and say the contract was entered into on January 8th. Uh, you might say, well, gosh, why would you favor one over the other? It's kind of a random issue which one you're going to favor. So you could randomly, I guess, have a rule that randomly says, well, we're just going to favor the offer or we're just going to favor the offeree. Uh, the reason that we've chosen to favor the offeree over the offeror, though, isn't completely random. There is a logic to it. And that logic we see in the next part, which has to do with the fact that this is the default rule. This is the usual rule when the offer or doesn't specify something different. But guess what? The offer or is the master of his offer. Master of offer. Just like he can make, a Bobby can make Sally jump up and down three times and squawk like a chicken to accept, the offer or can fashion a rule that is different for his offer than the mailbox rule. The mailbox rule applies only when the master of the offer, the offer or, hasn't specified a different rule. Here's an example about how the offer or, through clever uh, drafting, can create a different types of offer in which the mailbox rule doesn't apply. So our initial rule, the mailbox rule, did apply. On January 1, Sam makes an offer to Sarah and specifies she should mail her acceptance. 
But now Sam's gotten a little bit more savvy, and this is what he's saying now. On January 1, Sam makes an offer to Sarah and specifies that she should mail her acceptance. Okay, we already had this. But now we have this additional detail. In his offer, Sam states that Sarah's acceptance will become effective only after he receives Sarah's letter. Guess what? He has repealed the mailbox rule with respect to this particular offer. The mailbox rule only goes into effect when Sam's offer is silent on this topic. But Sam doesn't have to be silent. He has the power to draft it however he wants. And this is how it's going to help him. This is a good thing. So he ought to include this in all of his offers. Because the mailbox rule is bad for offerors, good for offerees. An offeror, obviously, is most interested in benefiting himself. So he's going to want to say, uh, mailbox rule doesn't apply. Now, of course, we only care about the mailbox rule when we are uh, requesting acceptance through some slowpoke method like writing, um, uh, which is a fairly rare thing nowadays. But there could be times where you actually want a wet signature on something. So let's see what happens when we have uh, not accepted the default mailbox rule, but we've come up with our own rule. In this case, on January 6th, Sarah does the same thing. He, she accepts Sam's offer by putting it in the mailbox. On January 8th, Sam receives Sarah's acceptance letters. On what date did Sarah effectively accept Sam's offer? With Under the mailbox rule, it will be January 5th, but under this new scenario, with this new language here, the acceptance became effective on January 8th. So just keep that in mind. The offeror should use his or her strategic advantage of being the master of the offer by creating an offer that suits his interests best. So a picture. There's not, not too many pictures out there at the mailbox rule. Okay. So unless the offer specifies differently than this, the acceptance is effective when the offeree transmits it. If the offeree uses the same medium as the offerer used to convey the offer. So there's really two ways that we see the mailbox rule coming up. One is when the offeror specifies, says, hey, you've got to mail it. Another way it can come up, though, is if Sam mailed the offer to Sarah, and Sarah can respond with that same method. Sam, when he mails it, doesn't have to specify that Sarah should mail a response but Sarah can clearly respond in the same way that Sam did. So there's really two circumstances the mailbox rule comes up. When Sam specifies mailing and when Sam actually mails the original offer to Sarah. Unless the offer specifies differently, acceptance is effective when the offeror receives it if the offeree uses a different medium than the offeror used to convey the letter. Okay, so you can see here, let's say Sam called Sarah up and said, hey, Sarah, um, I'm willing to sell you my bicycle for $500. Um, you know, if you accept, let me know. And Sarah chooses to mail it. Well, he's, she's using a different medium. Um, Sam used the telephone to orally convey the offer. Sarah chose to send a letter through snail mail. Well, guess what? Because Sarah is the one who chose the means of communication, the, uh, Sarah's offer is only going to be effective when the actual offer arrives at Sam's uh, home. So these are the, the, the differing rules. And you can see um, why there is a difference. Under this first scenario, Sam has set up the circumstances where the mail is being used. Under the second scenario, Sarah is the one who's kind of going her own way and choosing a different medium. So it makes sense that she bears the risk of there being that time gap and something strange happening um, when her letter is in transit. So a, a smart strategy is to always specify the mode, and mode of delivery, how the acceptance ought to happen, and when acceptance will occur. Will it occur? Uh, when the offeree sends it, when the offeror accept it, accepts it or receives it or some other standard. So being specific about that can save yourselves a hard, lot of heartache as the offeror. So that's our discussion of a written acceptance. Um, let's talk about um, an oral acceptance here. Let's see how that might work. Okay, so an oral acceptance is effective, obviously, when the offeror hears the offeree's assent or agreement. Um, it can happen in lots of different ways. It could be by per in person, by telephone, um, by you know uh, uh, 
uh, loudspeaker <laughs> um, by uh, 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 walkie-talkie, uh, whatever means might convey it. Uh, and again, unless the offeror has specified what means needs to be used, it can be any way that actually communicates it. And I suppose if you're using some a loudspeaker that's very, very garbled with lots of feedback, um, or you're using a phone that um, has a very low volume that person can't hear if you haven't been able to successfully communicate the content of what you're saying then the offer hasn't accepted under those circumstances so the offer or has to have been able to understand the information because obviously that's a requirement that the offer actually hears the the acceptance let's consider the last possibility which is that acceptance under certain circumstances can be implied. And here we have an example of this. When I go to into a restaurant, let's say it's a sit-down restaurant with waiter service, uh, the waiter presents me with the menu and it lists a variety of options and to the side it lists various prices. And um, maybe the waiter comes back in a few minutes and says, what would you like today? And I say, oh, this hamburger looks good and I think I'll have an order of onion rings. And he says, very good. He takes my menu away. Um, 10, 15 minutes later, he brings over a hamburger and a plate of onion rings. I eat the food. Um, at near the end, he presents me with a sheet of paper that lists, uh, you know, the items that I've purchased and gives me a total of what I owe. Um, I put that sheet of paper in my pocket and I head out the door. As I'm walking towards the door, he says, wait a second, uh, did you leave the money on the table? And I go, no, I didn't. He says, well, uh, are you coming up here to pay? No, no, not really. Well, how are you going to pay? I'm like, I'm not going to pay. Why would, why would I give you money? And he goes, well, you ordered a hamburger and, and, and onion rings. And the hamburger was $7 and the onion rings was $3. Um, so you owe me $10 plus tax. I go, oh, we didn't enter into a contract. I assume these were gifts. I thought you were wanting to give me this food for free. He goes, wait a second. Have you never been to a restaurant before? Don't you understand how restaurants work? Um, have you never seen one on TV? That what happens is you look at the menu, you see the price, you decide what you want to buy, and you're presented with the bill at the end, and you have to pay. The only reason why the restaurant gives you the food at first is because it understands that you will pay at the end. That's an implied situation. And those contracts are just as binding as any other contracts. Uh, it would be kind of silly if I went into the restaurant and I see the uh, menu and the waiter presents me with a contract. Well, ma'am, before I can accept your offer, we need to formalize this agreement in a contract. Here are all the, the provisions and all the prices and here we go and let's fill this out. I mean, that would add a lot of time to the dining experience. It would require restaurants to have many more wait waiters and waitresses. Um, it wouldn't really add anything to the dining experience. It would just add bureaucracy. Uh, because everybody who's been in the United States for very long at all knows how this process works. Um, even though it's an implied contract, it's an implied offer, and an implied acceptance, it still counts. Okay, so an implied acceptance occurs when the offeree performs, um, but uh, one type of acceptance that, or one, one something that, that may be considered acceptance um, really isn't um, completely, usually considered an acceptance, and that is silence or inaction. So let's go back to Bobby's scenario here. Let's say Bobby said, I will say this frog for $10. If you agree, you don't, just, just be quiet. Well, in that situation, Bobby is now forcing Sally to do something to get out of this. I mean, if she doesn't want to speak, um, the fact that she doesn't speak doesn't mean she agrees. She may just not want to speak. Maybe she's got laryngitis. Maybe she's just tired and she doesn't want to speak. Why should Bobby have the right or ability to force Sally to speak in order to reject an offer? Imagine if random people could make offers to you all day and you had to constantly say no. Um, 
you had to, uh, you know, every time you heard an ad on the TV, you had to say, I do not accept that offer. I do not accept that offer. That would get to be a drag after a while. Um, so uh, Bobby can't force Sally to uh, say something to say, I don't want that after all, or to do something. Uh, Sally is not Bobby's servant or her employee, and so uh, Sal Bobby can't force Sally to do something, generally speaking. But there are some exceptions to that rule. And one acceptance is when you have an ongoing business relationship. Oh, here we go. So we're going to look at uh, three, three scenarios where there's an exceptions. Uh, we've talked about the, the restatement of contracts before. Again, this is a document that is not a statute, that is a secondary source of law that is uh, created by private citizens, although very sophisticated legal scholars who know a lot about contract law. It's very, very re well respected, even though it's not a judge-made a case and it's not a statute. So uh, people oftentimes refer to the uh, restatements, especially uh, the, the restatement on contract law is a very, very reliable source. Anyway, the restatement, the, the, the scholars who wrote the restatement uh, read thousands of cases and they found three patterns where courts have tended to um, find acceptance to uh, an offer when there was silence or inaction on the part of the offeree. Let's look at those three scenarios. When the offeree takes the benefit of the offered service with a reasonable opportunity to reject it and had reason to know that the, off the service was offered with the expectation of compensation. This, as you can see, is very similar to the hamburger situation. I mean, I eat the hamburger. Um, I didn't have to eat the hamburger. Nobody forced it in my mouth. And I knew that this wasn't a charity. I mean, this wasn't the soup kitchen I was going to. I was going to Chili's or whatever. Um, under those circumstances, I impliedly accepted it when I ate the hamburger. Another situation where we've seen that courts are likely to find acceptance happens by silence or inaction is when the offer has a stated, stated or given the offeree reason to understand the assent may be manifest by silence or in action and the offeree intends to accept the offer. <clears throat> um, now this is a little bit harder to prove, um, but um, w when in the totality of the circumstances, again, we'd be applying an objective or reasonable person uh, case to establish um, that this has happened. Um, <clears throat> this is, um, Uh, not the most common of these scenarios. This would not be the way as an offer or you wouldn't want to structure it this way uh, because it does create a certain level of ambiguity. You would prefer to have the offeree actually speak. This last one is another common category though that we do see acceptance by silence and actions. Let's imagine that Bobby and Sally had an ongoing relationship. Uh, Bobby regularly trapped um, and captured frogs and uh, Sally regularly bought uh, the frogs from Bobby. Let's say that Sally had a, a frog selling business. She was a retail frog seller and um, Bobby was a supplier. And every month Sally needed to purchase about five frogs from, from Bobby. That was kind of the way that it was. And so uh, Bobby would show up at their place of business on the first day of the month with his inventory of or actually let's change it. Let's say that Bobby would send Sally a text on the first day of the month um, with stating his inventory of frogs. And each frog would, he was willing to sell for $10. Now, sometimes he would have four frogs, sometimes he'd have six frogs, sometimes he'd have five frogs. It varied from four to six. And this had been going on for seven months. And every month um, after uh, Bobby would send Sal Sally the email saying, hey, I have four frogs to sell you, um, she would say, yes, I accept your offer. I am willing to buy the four frogs for $5 each excuse me, $10 each. Um, and then they would um, meet the following day after school and actually complete the transaction. This has been going on for seven months. Um, there's been no change that Bobby knows to the relationship. Um, and so Bobby sends that same email on the eighth month. He has four frogs this month. He says, sends his, uh, a text to Sally, hey Sally, I have four frogs uh, to sell you for 10 bucks each. And Sally doesn't respond. Bobby shows up at the appointed place, Sally's there, they go on with the transaction. The next month, the same thing happens, Sally doesn't send any response at all. This time there are five frogs. 
the next day, uh, Bobby and Sally meet after school. Sally purchases the five frogs. It continues on like this for five more months. On the sixth month, Bobby sends yet another text saying, hey, Sally, I have four frogs this month, each for $10. I'll see you after school tomorrow so we can uh, make the exchange. Um, Bobby brings the uh, four frogs to the location after school. Sally's not there. Uh, Bobby approaches Sally the next day at school and says, hey, Sally, where were you? I brought the four frogs uh, to, to uh, let you buy them from me. And Sally goes, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I did not agree to purchase those four frogs. Uh, Bobby reminds Sally that for the last seven months, he's been sending these texts, and uh, she hasn't been responding to them, and yet she has shown up to make complete the purchase. That um, course of dealings between the two of them, uh, that well-established relationship, probably does mean that for Sally to not have accepted Bobby's offer, she needed to affirmatively do something. She needed to say, hey, wait a second, Bobby, not this month. I'm, I'm going to kind of back off my, my inventory position with respect to frogs, and so I'm not going to buy the four frogs this month. So given the previous dealings, it is possible sometimes that silence or inaction can cause acceptance. Um, so we can have um, acceptance by implication. Um, uh, I have a little slide here that's talking about um, if somebody's being annoying, uh, imply her mother is a llama. You might want to remember that little fact there. Let's go on, hint, 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 All right? Let's go on to the next slide. So we've talked about the three ways that acceptance can happen, either in writing or in oral format or implied. Again, we need to look to the terms of the offer, decide how those uh, methods will work. So now we have completed our first requirement for an acceptance. We know that, the, that for something to be an acceptance, the offering cannot accept something that does not meet the exact requirements of the offer. Again, we're going to think about the mirror image rule. And as part of that mirror image rule, we know that the acceptance must be in the form that the offer specified. And of course, an important part of this is the mailbox rule, which is the default rule. I'm just going to flip and compare this first rule of acceptance to the first rule for offers. Oops, here we go. Here. So our first rule for offer is that an offer must have an objective intent to be an offer. And now we know that the, um, so this kind of mirrors this. This is a companion to this. The offeree cannot accept something that does not meet the requirements of the offer. So the offeree has to have the objective intent to accept the offer that is made. So we look at what she or he says, the offeree says, to see whether there's an objective intent to match that offer. And we'll see, I'll just give you a preview here, that this one tracks with this one, and this one tracks with this one. Many people look upon these three requirements for acceptance as elements of acceptance, just like these three requirements are elements of an offer. So we could say here, if we're missing this first requirement, then we're missing one of the elements of an acceptance. If we're missing one element of acceptance, we don't have an acceptance. If we don't have an acceptance, we don't have an agreement. If we don't have an agreement, we don't have a contract. So let me go back to our, here we go. So we've covered our first element of acceptance, and now we're going to move on to our second element of acceptance. The acceptance must be unconditional and unequivocal. And we saw this in the de definition here. Let me just go back here. I don't have to go back very far. You see, we said in our definition of acceptance, and acceptance is the unconditional and unequivocal assent. So the acceptance must be unconditional and unequivocal. But we also need the same thing for the offer. So this is an example of, and it kind of makes sense that the same things we expect of an offer, we would expect from the acceptance. Um, if an offer is made in jest, for example, or it's an example of exaggeration, that the person really didn't intend to make an offer, 
or um, there were lots of missing details in the offer. Maybe the price or the quantity or the time of delivery or who it's going to be offered to. Um, the T's weren't crossed, the I's weren't dotted. Well, when we see that same thing in an acceptance, just like in the offer, we say, nah, it's not really an acceptance. For example, imagine that when Bobby says to Sally, I will sell this frog for you for $10 and Sally goes, yeah, I mean, that might work for me. I'm just, yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, okay. I, I, yeah, whatever. Is that really an acceptance? Because it's not that clear. It sounds kind of like an acceptance, but it's not fully an acceptance. It's not unequivocal. It's not unconditional. And so we would say that, no, it's not an acceptance. So just like the offer has to be unconditional, unequivocal, the acceptance also has to be unconditional, unequivocal. But again, this isn't a psycho psychology test. We're not trying to psychoanalyze the offeree. We're going to apply that reasonable person standard, that objective standard. We don't really care, honestly, what's going on in the mind of the offeree. We care about the totality of the circumstances and what that fly on the wall would have thought. Would that fly on the wall have thought that the offeree was making an acceptance that was unconditional and unequivocal? If that's the case, guess what? We have satisfied the second requirement for an offer, that the acceptance be unconditional and unequivocal. So just like the acceptance must be unconditional and unequivocal, the offer must be definite and certain. Basically, these are just the same. Words have the same meaning for the same idea. Okay, and now we have our last element. Again, if, if, the, uh, if the acceptance is not unconditional and or not unequivocal, then we haven't satisfied this element of acceptance. Therefore, we don't have an acceptance. If we don't have an acceptance, we don't have an agreement. If we don't have an agreement, we don't have a contract. So these, we need to have every, every one of these lined up. Our third element is the acceptance must be directed to the offeror. Okay, going back to our scenario, in our scenario, it's pretty obvious that Bobby just wants to sell his frog to Sally. There's nobody else present. He's talking to her only. Uh, but let's say that there was another boy over here. Well, I'll make it a boy. It could be a girl who also has some frogs. If, Sal, if Bobby says, Bob, uh, Sally, I will sell this frog to you for $10, and then Sally goes, I'll buy George's frog for $10. Is that an acceptance? Or let's say that Sally runs over here to me, I guess this is me over here, and whispers in my ear, I accept Bobby's offer to buy his frog for $10. But I'm not Bobby's friend, his mom is confidant. I'm not anything to Bobby. Bobby couldn't hear what Sally just said to me. So did Sally accept the offer? Well, no. Until Bobby knows about it, Sally can't accept the offer, with the one exception being the mailbox rule. So the acceptance must be directed to the offer or to no one else. And again, this is the same rule that we saw with the offer. The offer or has to direct the offer to the offeree. So it's not surprising that the acceptance must also be directed to the offer or. This is our third element of acceptance. If it's missing, we don't have an acceptance. If we don't have an acceptance, we don't have an agreement. If we don't have an agreement, we don't have a contract. So now we have completed our discussion of offer and acceptance. We have both of the two elements of agreement now covered. And again, here's our third that just we finished talking about. The acceptance must be directed to the offer or. Guess what? That's just like this one. The offer or must communicate the offer to the offeree or offerees. So these track pretty closely. So it's, it's helpful to see that connection. So it makes it a little bit easier to be able to remember them as we're going into tests. So again, we have our, 
our four elements. We have agreement, which is our first element, which we've covered. We talked about it in chapter two, and now we've covered it in more detail in chapter three. Then we have our second element, which is consideration. We covered in chapter two, we'll cover it in more detail in chapter four. Then we'll talk about legal capacity in chapter six and legal object in chapter seven. Then in this chapter, we drilled down and got into a little bit more detail about this agreement requirement. We talked about how there were two sub-elements to agreement, offer and acceptance. And then we drilled even more and we talked about how offer had elements too. It had this element, this element, and this element. And then we talked about how acceptance also had sub-elements, this element, this element, and this element. So now we are really and truly done with our agreement discussion. Um, and let's continue on and talk about <clears throat> how we terminate an offer. So now we're kind of switching gears. We've talked about how we establish an offer. We've talked about how we establish an acceptance. But you know what? Sometimes offers are made and there's just no response from the offeree. Again, the offeror doesn't have the ability to force the offeree to say yes or no. The offeree might just not say anything. And so we don't know what the state is that that whole situation is. What happens to an offer that the offeree never responds to? I mean, that's a real issue. Let's figure out how that's going to work out. How does an offer terminate? What are the mechanisms that can cause it to terminate? Well, we have kind of three buckets, three categories of scenarios that can cause an offer to terminate. One is when certain events happen. So we'll call this the event-based bucket. And then we're also going to talk about the actions of the parties. Actually, the word parties is a little bit of a misnomer here because we don't have a contract yet, so we can't have parties to a contract. But here we're talking about the actions of the offer or and the offer e. That's what we mean when we're talking about the parties. And then we have a third category, which is the operation of law. I've arranged this a little bit differently than the textbook because I, the full of the textbook didn't make a lot of sense to me. So hopefully, if, the, if it made sense to you in the textbook, feel free to follow that. But if not, um, this may make more sense to you. At least I hope it will. Okay, so we're going to talk about this first category. We're going to talk about events first. So obviously, there are certain things that can happen that can cause um, an offer to terminate. Let's go back to the example where Sam is trying to sell something to Sarah, his bicycle. Um, he wants uh, to sell it to Sarah for $500. Um, but you know what? The night, he makes the offer to Sarah on January 1st, and um, uh, on January 2nd, there is a, a bad storm and lightning strikes the a bicycle. It's destroyed. It's a twisted, burnt metal that is just not repairable at all. It's, it's garbage at this point. Um, at that point, even though Sarah doesn't know about it, maybe even Sam doesn't know about it, when the subject matter of the offer is destroyed, um, then at that moment, the offer goes poof. It no longer exists because there's no sense of selling something that doesn't exist. You can't sell something that's no longer present, right? So um, that's one way that an offer terminates. Sometimes things are destroyed uh, via what we call acts of God in the law. And this doesn't have a religious connotation despite the, the use of the word God. It really is describing natural phenomenon like fires, floods, earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes. Um, another term that's related to this is force majeure. Uh, this is a French term, as you perhaps talked about, I can't remember. But in, in uh, the law, we oftentimes borrow language words from other languages. We have a lot of Latin terms that we use. Um, one of the reasons for that is that uh, English uh, 
was obviously was, was spoken in England forever, but um, it wasn't a written language for many years. And uh, the written language in England was Latin. That was the language that had, had been received even before there was a written version of English that was widely available to um, people. Uh, but in addition to that, after William the Conqueror invaded and conquered Great Britain in 1066, he rolled and guess what? He was a Norman, he was a French speaker. And so the language of court in the language of the courts was Norman French. Um, and as a result, we have a fair number of French terms in our legal system today. Um, and this is an example of one of those terms, force majeure. And this is a little bit broader than the term act of God because it does cover things that are not strictly speaking natural issues. For example, it would cover things like strikes or wars or things like that, things that human beings were involved in causing. Um, the, the thing about force majeure is though that the parties themselves can't have caused it. For example, if Sam intentionally threw the bike off the side of a high rise and when it fell to the ground it was destroyed, well that wouldn't count as um, uh, something covered by force majeure because Sam caused it to happen. But let's imagine that Sam's uh, bike was stolen from some, by somebody and that person took the bike up to the top of the high rise and threw it down. Well, Sam had no control over that. Obviously the person who did it had control over it, so we can't really call it an act of God. But because it's out of Sam's control, we would say the idea of force majeure applies to it. Okay, another thing that can happen that can terminate an offer is kind of nothing. <laughs> when nothing happens, when the person who uh, is the offeree doesn't actually accept or reject the offer, but just kind of sits on it for a while, eventually it will expire on its own because of the lapse of time. And there's kind of two ways that this can play out. One way is when the offer itself specifies a time. Hey, I'll give you until five o'clock tomorrow. Well, guess what? At 5.01 p.m. that day, the next day, then that offer will no longer be in effect. And if Sarah actually accepts the offer, say at 5.02 p.m., she's not accepting it. She is actually making her own offer, which may or may not be accepted. So sometimes the offer actually includes an expiry time. And so that would apply. But a lot of times they don't include an expiry time. So then you have to kind of apply a rule of common sense. What's reasonable under the circumstances? And that oftentimes is going to turn upon what's the subject matter um, of this particular uh, topic. For example, a loaf of bread is going to become stale and moldy a lot faster than a car. So you might anticipate that an offer to sell a loaf of bread is going to expire a lot faster than maybe an offer on a car might. Um, you'd, you'd want to look to local customs in these areas. Another type of limit, time limitation that can sometimes play a role is a statute of limitations. Um, we know that a statute of limitation, you can see again, it's in red and it's in bold. This, the, the, this, this placement in the chapter makes some sense. It doesn't make perfect sense, but the idea here is that um, you can't file a lawsuit after a certain time period, after the statutory period has expired. So if I make an offer to settle a lawsuit with you, let's say we were in a car accident and you know, it's clearly my fault and we've been doing a back and forth negotiation, you haven't actually filed your lawsuit and let's say the statutory period for your claim is gonna expire at three years and so it's gonna expire next Tuesday. We've been going back and forth and back and forth. We haven't reached a final agreement and you have proposed that we settle the lawsuit for $15,000. Um, I'm still thinking about it one way or the other. Um, or let's, let's say I, I counter um, and I say, I'm willing to settle for $12,000. Well, Wednesday comes and goes and you haven't responded one way or the other. You haven't said yes or no. Thursday comes, you haven't filed your lawsuit. You call me up and go, you know what? I will accept your $12,000. Well, guess what? Because you no longer have a claim against me because you waited too long, um, you're really not providing any consideration to this dispute because you can't sue me. And so my offer would have expired at the exact same time the statutory period had expired, um, unless I had specified otherwise. And so um, the reasonable time for that would be when you could no longer file your lawsuit. 
So those are just some examples of certain events that can cause an offer to terminate. Let's consider how the parties, the offer or and the offer e, can affect uh, the termination. We've kind of already talked about this a little bit, so this should be a pretty quick topic. One, uh, there's kind of three ways that we think about. One is through a counter offer. Um, if I make a counter, if I'm the offer e and I make a counter offer, hey, you know, I'm Sally and I. Um, uh, say, oh, I'll, I'll buy that frog for $9. I may not actually intend to, um, I, you know, I may, I may want to keep that option of accepting that $10 offer on the table, but guess what? I can't. I don't have that option legally to me. If I counter, the initial offer goes poof. Um, if I change any of those terms under the common law. So a counter offer makes that first offer go away. Another way I could do that as the offeree is I can, um, and both of these are, are things that the offeree does, is I can just flat out reject it. And here's when I say no thanks, but don't make a counter. And again, I can reject it in a written form, in an oral form, or an implied form, just like I can make an acceptance in any of those forms. So here, I'm not saying I'm willing to enter into a contract with you in some other method. I'm just saying, uh, not going to happen. Um, either one of those cancels the initial offer. But the offer or also has the ability to terminate an offer. And this is by revocation. Um, this is a strange thing. This is a surprising thing for most folks about how offers work. Um, I said before, let me just go back to the previous slide so we can see what I'm getting at here. I said before that um, Um, that sometimes a, an expiry time is specified in the offer itself. I say, hey, you've got to accept this by 5 uh, p.m. tomorrow. You might have interpreted that pretty reasonably, in my opinion, but you might have interpreted that to mean, well, then that means that the offeror can't revoke the offer before 5 p.m. Let's even make it stronger. Let's say that Sam says to Sarah, um, you can buy my my bike for five hundred dollars. I'm going to leave this offer open until five o'clock tomorrow, five p.m. tomorrow. You can accept any time up until that time, and I commit that I will leave this offer open for that period of time. Okay, Sarah goes about her business. She shops around for more bikes. Um, she goes to several stores. It's four p.m. the following day. She's decided that Sam's bike is the best for her at that price, so she calls him up. And before Sarah says anything, Sam goes, "I revoke. I revoke my offer." What? But but you told me I would have until five p.m. It's only four p.m. now. You're right, Sarah. You're right. I did say that to you. But I'm not a person of my word, and I'm not going to stick by that. And I revoked before you accepted, so therefore you can't accept. And even though I don't think Sam's actions are perhaps the most laudable ever, they are lawful. They, uh, he can revoke up until the moment of acceptance. The only time that he can't revoke is when there is an option contract. An option contract creates an irrevocable offer. So let's talk about why Sam can say one thing and not follow through. I mean, that's not a good thing. We don't like that in the law. We don't like that in life. We want people to honor their commitments. The reason that we allow Sam to revoke is the whole idea of consideration. And we've talked about that previously. Let me just go back here to our list of elements. We have this as our second element, consideration. If when Sam made his offer, hey, Sarah, you can have until um, 5 p.m. tomorrow, and I promise to keep the offer open, um, he was uh, giving Sarah, I guess you could say, a gift in a certain sense, because Sarah had done nothing at this point. She had given Sam nothing. She hadn't committed to a contract. Um, so she was providing no consideration to this circumstance. So how can Sam be bound by a contract to the Sarah has no um, requirements that she do anything? Uh, if, if Sam is bound, then Sarah also has to be bound in order for there to be a contract. If there's no contract, then Sam doesn't have to follow his word. I mean, it's certainly a good thing for him to do. I'm not saying that he ought to break his word, but there's no legal requirement that he follow his word because Sarah has provided no consideration. But on the other hand, if Sarah had 
provided earnest money, um, which is oftentimes what it's called, uh, then an option contract could have been created. Let's see what that might look like. So again, Sam wants to sell his bike for $500. Sarah seems interested. Sam says, hey, I understand you want to shop some more. Uh, just be sure to get back to me by 5 p.m. tomorrow, and I promise I won't sell it to anyone else. And if you want you know, if you want this this promise of mine to be enforceable, why don't you give me a nickel? And if you end up completing this transaction with me, that nickel will, uh, you know, count against the five hundred dollars that you owe me. And if you decide to buy your bike elsewhere, well, then you're not going to get that nickel back. I will be a nickel richer than I otherwise am. Now, obviously, the nickel, you might say, well, that's kind of ridiculous. A nickel for a $500 purchase potential, uh, that has trivial economic value. But remember, with consideration, we're not concerned with the amount of consideration. We just need to have some kind of consideration. It can even be almost a symbolic consideration. So now, Sarah, if she agrees to provide the nickel or penny or you know use tissue or whatever we might be using she has provided consideration uh, by providing that that item and so Sam his consideration is his promise to keep the option contract open now he is bound now Sarah and Sam have an option contract Okay, so here's a little mnemonic to remember the way that parties can cancel or terminate an offer. And here we have career. You can see that all of the consonants in career make up the actions by the party. So it's just a little uh, way of thinking about that. And here's a little bit, this is again, we're just specifying them in more detail, the ways that the parties can terminate by a counter offer, by rejection. And here's again a definition of rejection. And then we have a revocation. Here's a definition of revocation. Be, again, always, always be sure to be uh, learning these terms for quizzes and tests. And then we have the option contract. An offer combined with an agreement supported by consideration. And again, who's providing the consideration? By the offeree here, right? Not to revoke the offer for a specified period of time. An irrevocable offer is an offer made in a signed writing that is an option contract, which by its terms give assurance that it will be held open and not terminated by the offer or. Um, this is um, basically, for, the, for our purposes now, consider this a synonym for an option contract. We'll talk a little bit later on about how this isn't quite a synonym for it, but it's pretty darn close. So for now, uh, learn both definitions, but, but for our purposes, they're very, very, very similar. So we've talked about how um, the happening of certain events can terminate an offer, the actions of the parties can terminate an offer, now we're going to look at how operation of the law can terminate. And this is not an exhaustive list, these are just some examples of circumstances. Um, of course, when we talk about the operation law, we're talking about some intervening factor outside the party's control, some legal implication. Uh, let me give an example. Uh, when I started college, um, the drinking age in the state where I attended college was 18. And so when I started college, I was legally old enough to drink. But during that first year that I was in college, um, the drinking age in that state went up to 21. And so it became no longer lawful for me to drink. And people were not grandfathers. So one day people were old enough to drink and the very next day they would not were not eligible to drink. Um, so imagine that I had entered into a contract with a beer distributor and the beer distributor was going to drop off a keg of beer at my dorm room every Friday at 5 p.m. and I would pay obviously the beer distributor for that. And I entered in the contract when I was 18, when the law provided that 18 year olds could drink, it was a perfectly lawful contract. Um, and the contract provided that we would stay in this contract for the term of the school year. We'll say that was 36 weeks. So um, every week on Friday at 5 p.m., the keg would be delivered and I would pay for it. The keg would be delivered, pay for it, delivered, pay for it. Then the law changed. Let's say the law changed on a Wednesday. Well, then on that Friday, guess what? Guess who's not getting a keg of beer? I'm not getting a keg of beer because that contract is now unlawful because I am now 
underage and not eligible to buy beer. Uh, so when the beer distributor fails to deliver the keg of beer at five o'clock on Friday, it's not in breach of the contract. Our contract no longer exists. Similarly, I'm not required to pay for the beer because I have no obligation to fulfill the terms of a contract that is not lawful. That would be an example of when the legality of such a matter changes. Another circumstance is when there's the death or insanity of the offer or. Um, now keep in mind this applies only when the offer has not become a contract. Okay, when no contract yet. There's different rules when the parties have actually entered into a contract. This is when there is just an offer that has not been accepted. So if, God forbid, little Bobby here gets struck by lightning while Sally is considering whether she wants to buy the frog or not, let's say a lightning bolt comes down, <laughs> strikes him dead, and um, somehow the frog survives, so we don't have a, a subject matter destruction of the frog, um, Sally can't accept the offer. Now let's say, though, that Bobby made this offer to Sally. I will sell this frog to you for $10, and Sally accepts it, and then the lightning bolt comes down. Uh, for poor Bobby is killed, but the frog survived. The contract is still valid. A contract that has been accepted, that has become a contract, doesn't require that the offer or offer or now the contractor is still alive. But when it is in an unaccepted state, the offer or must continue to live, or and also not be insane. <laughs> so that's a, a requirement. So we have covered the three ways that, uh, three categories of circumstances in which offers can terminate. When certain events like statute of limitations, the passage of time, the terms of the offer have expired. When the actions of the parties, the career scenario, counter offer, rejection, revocation, one of those have occurred. Or operational law, a subsequent illegality, um, uh, insanity of the offer or or death of the offer or those are circumstances that would terminate the offer let's consider uh, uh, these are terms that we've looked at previously but let's look at these two terms from the perspective of how offers might terminate you may recall that a unilateral contract we can see from the beginning we have the word uni which means one in the law, kind of like a unicycle. Well, a unilateral contract is a one-sided contract with one promise. A bilateral contract, like a bicycle, has two wheels. A bicycle has two wheels, so a bilateral or two-sided contract has two promises. Bilateral, two promises. You know, the vast majority of contracts that you'll be involved in in your practice will be bilateral contracts. Um, but unilateral contracts are enforceable. They're by definition not in writing, of course. The, uh, let me give an example, just a little refresher. Um, by the way, uh, unilateral and bilateral contracts are, are having to do with the procedure of the contract, not the substance. So you can have the same deal be presented as a bilateral contract or a unilateral contract. Let me give you an example. Um, uh, Bob says to Sally, um, I promise to um, pay you $1,000 if you promise to paint my barn. And Sally says, I promise to paint your barn if you promise to pay me $1,000. That's two promises. Bob is making, Bobby's making one promise to pay $1,000, Sally's making one promise, to paint the barn. That's a bilateral uh, contract. That's a good contract. That's the preferred method. But let's think about a different type of contract. The same transaction, but now we're going to present it as a unilateral contract. This time, Bob says to Sally, I agree. I promise to pay you $1,000 if you paint my barn. 
Sally goes, oh, that sounds good. I promise to paint your barn if you promise to pay me $1,000. Bob says, no, 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 you didn't understand. I don't want your promise. I want you to actually do it. The only way you can accept this offer is by actually starting the painting. Remember, I'm the offer or I'm the master of my offer. Just like I can make you jump up and down three times and squawk like a chicken to accept my offer if I want, I can also make you start performing. That can be the only way you can accept if that's what I want and that's what I want. Sally thinks about it. She goes, well, okay, I guess that's how I'll accept then. Um, so Sally starts painting. That's her way of accepting. That's a unilateral contract. Again, both are enforceable, but there's problems with unilateral contracts because there's a certain level of uncertainty. Because when Sally starts painting, it's a little bit unclear whether she's accepting that unilateral contract that Bob offered or maybe she's countering it. Um, let's say that Bob said, well, I want to paint, paint it red, but instead Sally paints it um, maroon. Is that an acceptance or is that a counter? Huh, not quite sure. Um, or let's say that Bob had specified that he wanted um, a certain quality of paint, a certain maybe the um, the Sherwin Williams brand of paint, and she uses the um, uh, the Bear brand of paint. Um, is that an acceptance or is that a counter? So you can see how there can be some ambiguity about this, especially with the mirror image rule. Um, the bilateral contract is usually easier to decide whether the offeree is accepting or countering or rejecting. So you can see, generally speaking, you want to be in the bilateral contract area as opposed to the unilateral contract area. So what are some takeaways that we can think about as we approach this chapter? Well, when you are representing the offer or, please advise that offer or to specify how acceptance ought to happen, when the acceptance will be effective, will be effective when it's communicated or when it's received by the offeror, and is there an expiry date with respect to the offer. Um, it's a good idea sometimes to actually have the offeree sign um, the offer letter um, uh, to indicate that the offeree has seen all of the terms of the offer um, and knows what those terms are. Um, even if the offeree isn't sure whether he's going to accept or reject that offer. Um, there's an error in at least some editions of the textbook that talks about um, a revocation of offer. It mis misidentifies as a revocation of offer when in fact it's an option contract. So if you're going through it and that seems a source of confusion, uh, just be aware that there's an error in the textbook. Um, thank you for your attention today. If you have any questions, as always, please feel free to come by my office or send me an email, um, and we'll be glad to figure out how I can support you and help you with that material. As always, I thank you for your attention, and I hope you have a wonderful day.